I felt the Holy Spirit highlight that piece and says, Gabe, like that's what I'm doing on the earth right now. Over the next three decades, population growth in Africa will change the course of human history. Hello, and welcome back to the YWAM Kona podcast. I'm Liam, and today I'm joined by Gabe Stridham, who leads our fire and fragrance base in South Africa. Also lived here for a number of years and as a leader in our movement. Um, Gabe, I'd love for you to introduce yourself a little yes. bit and say a little bit about what you're doing in South Africa. Yes, Liam, so good to be here. Hey guys, so fun. Um, yeah, it's such a joy. I think, well, let me always start like that. Our, when we start doing in South Africa, we lead a, a, a fine fragrance community there as a part of the YWAM larger family. And it actually started way before we joined YWAM. Me and one of my best friends, his name is Evgia, Evgia Fushia. We both used to play rugby together. We both used to be professional rugby players and we became best friends like that. And um, I got born again out of a pretty wild background and drugs and stuff. And the first person I led to Jesus, was actually my best friend was him, right? We went to a bar. And then um, Michelle, my wife, and the lady that now leads our prayer room, Yulizna, was sitting outside of a, a, at the bar in a car. This is 11 years ago. Oh my goodness. Right? <laughs> Interceding that he would get saved. I went into the bar, right? I'm drinking water. He's like, why are you not drinking alcohol? I was like, buddy, I just, I, I met the, the thing we've been looking for. Mm. And all the years we've been doing drugs, we've, we've been using this phrase, chasing the dragon. And I said, bro, I, I found what happens if you catch it. Whoa. He's like, what is it? I said, I found Jesus. And he started laughing at me. He's like, what do you mean? I just started telling bro, like I met God. And all of a sudden we've known each other for eight years. He just started weeping. I've never seen him cry. And he's like, whatever that is, I want it, please. So I led him to the Lord inside this bar. Went and did my DTS, long story short, came back after my DTS. And um, we went to his fraternity. And inside of his fraternity, we wrote on the wall in the pursuit of wonder. And we kind of had this deal with each other. Let's see how close we can get to God without dying. That was our goal. Wow, that's an ambitious goal. <laughs> right. Like that was it. Me and him were like, hey, like let's just see these two big guys. He's like my size, a little bit shorter, but Jack guy. He's in the one quarter, I'm in the other quarter. And our only goal was let's just get to Jesus. And then we put on Stephanie Frizzell. She wasn't gretching her yet. And we just met with God. And so then a week later, he brought his girlfriend, who's now his wife. I brought my girlfriend, who's now my wife. And then the biggest nights were like five, 600 university students from multiple churches. And we just kind of saw what happened when we gathered around God's presence. And um, through that, um, we went to outreaches all over the world. Our first one was to Amazon, which was the craziest trip I've ever been to. And then um, we the went- The first one. Right, no. Well, my first one was into um, a war zone in the Middle East. The second one was into the Amazon. And the third one was hiking in the high Himalayas. Wow. And um, that's in the Himalaya one, we actually met um, FNF for the first time. Okay. I remember we just, we stepped into this prayer room as me and a few of my buddies. I was still um, a pastor. And uh, I just saw these people in the middle of nowhere, the most horrible place I've ever been then, just in like how dark it felt, being so joyful. And I remember me and all my friends looked at each other, I was like, why are they so happy? And the only deduction we could make about the joy that they radiated was because they actually have built their ministry around the presence of Jesus. And not just what they put out, but actually they get to minister to him and then do ministry. So long story short, came to Kona a few years later, staffed here for a few years, moved back to South Africa. And we just kind of started with that framework in mind. And God gave us a word. He says, if you build an altar, they will come. And we just, 26 of us together, started building a house of prayer. And we just did it. And um, we thought we we're going to do a lot of other things. And then Jesus was like, no, start here. This is the beginning of 2020. And um, we started there and then we felt the Holy Spirit and prayer speak to us and say, hey, I want you to build out 52 days of prayer, like kind of like devotions and build a, an, a, a, a website that shows where the people do these devotions are praying from. Okay. And we didn't know why it was so strange. We're like, yeah. no, no, we want to go disciple a nation. You don't, this is, let's go, let's go to a hundred high schools. Let's like go do big crusades. Like let's do great events. And God's like, no, no, I want you to build a house of prayer. And I want you to build these 52 devotions and build a website. When we're finished with all of that, a week later, COVID broke out and our whole nation shut down for two months. Nobody could do anything. And we had all of the content. We had a website, everything that was needed to keep our community going. We had, I think, close to 700 people from 13 different nations praying with us over that time. We had devotions we can give to them and that actually launched what our base is doing. It gave us like a reputation in South Africa that we were praying people. And then churches and organizations and ministries started asking us to coach them in prayer. 
And from there, we launched our DTS. And so now we have our prayer room. We do our DTS, which is a discipleship training school. We have DBS Bible schools we're running. We have every, which is these living room gatherings, which our goal is to touch God in prayer and then reach our friends with evangelism. Last year, I think we did 500 gatherings. I think we gathered like 27,000 people. Um, Caitlin, who's one of our good friends, you guys made a video with her. She is running like a, 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 a ministry that helps like set prostitutes and women that were taken advantage of free off the streets. Mm. And we have an old age home ministry. We can talk about that, wow. which is wild. That's really interesting. Gen Zers doing an old age home ministry, <laughs> which is wild <laughs> and amazing what God is doing. We do yeah. stuff with drug rehabs. Um, we have a preschool and God is just doing so much. It's so cool how God, how God from prayer birthed yes. all these things and just exploded. I'd love to hear more about your every tour. Cause yes. you guys went to like almost every nation in Africa. Yes. Like yes. 50. Yeah. We went to, we went to every nation in Africa except one. Mm -hmm. And it's because we couldn't get into one nation specifically. And I think um, this year, we got a way in, so hallelujah. Mm -hmm. We're gonna make Praise take God. that one. So, Praise God. yeah. So, yeah, I'd love to just hear about your experience. Yes. In that, like, what? Yes. On the ground, I mean, you went to a couple. I'm assuming yeah. you have your team going all over, yeah. but it just as like a picture of what God is doing yes. in Gen Z over Africa. Yes. I'd love for you to share that. Yeah. So we we named this like the what the prayer strike we did. I'll, I'll explain this right now. What we did. We named it Project 54, and the idea was to go to every one of the 54 nations of Africa over a 10 day period and do um, a six to eight hour prayer burn. Mm. And just say, God, we're serious about Africa. We're serious about your dream. This is not a pipe dream. This was not like um, Reinhard Bonnke's dream, like Africa will be blood washed, Africa shall be saved. That's that was that's not just his dream, that's Jesus' dream. And we have just learned through how we've done the hard work of missions is prayer. So we spent thousands of hours of prayer in South Africa, but if we want to believe for the rest of Africa, let's spend time in prayer there. So we took 466 flights right and we as a community in over 10 days went to every nation in africa except one and um what we experienced was mind-blowing i think that the amount of movement that is happening across africa right now from cape to cairo literally not exaggerating when saying that is amazing i think that um john Hopkins university wrote an article recently about the future of africa literally this is a, a secular university wrote this and their first sentence says the following this is not like christian hype this is not like Gabriel that's a missionary in Africa trying to tell you to value Africa. This is like a scientific journal that's scrutinized by peers. First sentence is this. It says, um, over the next three decades, population growth in Africa will change the course of human history. Now, then I want you to think about that, the course of human history. Like academic journals, they, they, they get taught not to exaggerate stuff like that. So that means like this is scrutinized fact. Some of the reason why is Africa's population, some people say will quadruple in numbers. Whoa. Right? Yeah. This is yeah. In wild. Line, like in line, uh, population growth with, as along with like economic and like yeah. other, those things like, like are growing. At the same everything time. is growing, but the pressure on infrastructure is also growing. Uh -huh. Right? Then with all of, there's a ton of good and there's a ton of bad growing with more people. Right. But we need to believe as Christians that like God values all of life and those people coming alongside us because God has a plan and a destiny for Africa. Mm -hmm. And we totally believe that. And I think the average age of Africa right now is 18.9. Wow. So the, it's That's, teenagers. It's a lot of teenagers. Currently we're <laughs> 1.3 billion people. The average age is a teenager. Wow. Right. And, and in my heart, I'm like, man, this is, this is God is birthing something. Yeah. And when we first um, felt to move to South Africa, and I'll say this and I'll share a little bit more about Project 54, mm -hmm. the, the, something that God highlighted in prayer for me was a speech. This is the, the Winston Churchill speech. We'll fight them on the beaches. Yes, that that yes, whole that speech. Famous, yeah, yeah, famous, famous speech of his. But at the end of that speech, he makes a statement. He says, and if for some unforeseen reason, this island of ours will fall, the new world will come to the saving of the old. And I felt the Holy Spirit highlight that piece and says, Gabe, like that's what I'm doing on the earth right now. The old world, the guys who from where Christianity spread to the rest of the nations, the new world, those the the, the old used to be colonized nations, they will now become the missionaries that will be sent back to those places. I have chills. <laughs> right. And so now we see, and this is this is wild, right? This is the wisdom of God. Think about this. That the largest churches in Europe are ran by Africans. Mm. 
right? And 150 years ago, nobody could have imagined this. They would have said, Gabe, are you high? Like, what are you drinking? And God is, Psalm 2, scoffing, mocking the kings of the earth yeah. with his wisdom. Yeah, it's so the Lord to take the, like, to take the, the humble and the meek and oh, exalt them over the, over the what, prideful. What would be yeah. wise and prideful, right? And, yeah. and, it's, and God is not against nations, but he does exalt what you're saying, like his own wisdom for his glory. Mm. And in London is the first ever post post Christian nation, which means there was a dip in Christianity and now there's a positive growth again. And one of my friends in England told us the story. And he says the reason that happened is because when they started doing research, they realized Nigerians are planting so many churches in London that there's a positive growth in church growth in London. Like one of the, like probably the main financial capital of the world mm. has a positive growth in church attendance because Africans are planting so many churches. And so, amazing. So, so when you think about all these statistics and then we put our feet on the ground and I'm in Kenya and these, some of my friends um, are a part of a movement that the previous 12 months they saw 400,000 high school kids get saved. There's another Kenyan leader who, who teaches in Ivy League schools all over the US. Another Kenyan leader whose small group discipleship content are used by 7,000 Western churches. And I'm seeing in front of me, man, God is raising up his church in Africa to be a blessing to the nations of the earth. And, and, and we have friends all over. If I think what's happening in Nigeria right now, and um, Daniel Hoxalang just told the story of one of his friends talking about Port Harcourt, a church being built that has 120,000 seats. I don't even know that happened in the world. It's a right? big like, church. What, what is it? Like, I don't even know what it's like. Church. Our biggest stadium in South Africa has, doesn't have small stadiums. 100,000 people. I'm like, your church, every Sunday gathering will be more than our largest sport events. Yeah, that's a mega church. Right? <laughs> totally. And, and, and people can, can decide whatever they think about it. Yeah. But I'm saying it has to be some measure of of representation of the heart of God. And not just his heart, but the heart of his as an Africa that is erupting in a way that we need to believe that Africa is not just a missions receiving place, it's actually becoming a mission sending place. And so um, another fun story, a specific country, I can't say the country's name because it's a close nation. Some of our, our guys were there and um, there was this man um, that used to be a Muslim, and he, he was talking about how um, he got born again. And the way he got saved is like he, um, he was in the desert, and a man all dressed in white on a white horse with his sword drawn walked up to him and started talking to him. He says, who am I? He said to him, who are you? And he said to him, well, go ask your imam. So he went to the imam and asked the imam, well, who is he? And the imam said, well, we, I don't know, go ask the Christians. And that's how he got saved. My goodness. <laughs> right. And, and and there's stories like this all around if you're just seeing like this God activity that goes beyond necessarily our effort. But that is clearly evidence of God moving in this beautiful continent. And so it's been so humbling witnessing something that's beyond man's agenda. It's as if God's cosmic hand has landed in Africa and is drawing out the gold for the world to see. And I believe that the ministries, organizations, the nations that have eyes to see and partner with God's dream in Africa over the next hundred years will be blessed Wow! because of what's happening there. Mm. What do you think that looks like for ministries, for mission organizations? In, it's a good question. What's happening? Yeah. And I, and I think that like what I would say is, let me answer that two ways. I think the one way is we cannot ignore the depth of poverty. You need to understand if we get four times the amount of people, up to four times, in areas that are already struggling with food, it will be four times less food. Right, yeah. Which is a crisis. Mm -hmm. But it also means four times more innovation because people fix problems, right? So that's the positive side of it. We also need to understand four times more pressure on infrastructure, but also four times more opportunity for finances to go to infrastructure. So it, it plays against each other. So. When I'm going to talk about what I'm going to talk about, I'm not neglecting that God really needs to send solutions when it comes to poverty, when it comes to clean water, when it comes to sanitation, infrastructure, those things need to happen. But I believe that there is something to be said that we need to understand that 
the organizations and the ministries that have eyes to see would recognize those lecturers that teach at Ivy League schools are not isolated right. instances. Right. Those leaders that are discipling 7,000 Western churches, those young leaders who are reaching 400,000 high schoolers, and to go and go like, you're a part of my body, because it's his body. He's the head, the body is the church, and you're, you're the thumb, and, right? I'm the ring finger, and instead of going like, how do I, um, how do I always like come and give a helping hand to Africa? Maybe it's time to ask, how can Africa give a helping hand to me? Mm, the shift of paradigms. The shift of paradigms. Mm. And it doesn't mean that I'm South African, born and raised, so I'm African. It doesn't mean that I don't need the West. That is unbiblical. I fully need the West because I also need the East. I also need Europe, right? I also need like Oceania. I also need South America. Why? Because the church is only a body if we're diverse. Right. But course, I yeah. think like there's a paradigm shift to go like God has clearly raised up leaders in this time in Africa. And how do we learn from them? Because what Africa is doing right now when it comes to some of their stuff on drawing a line when it comes to God's design for family, God's design for male and female. Like there's stuff happening right now in Africa where they're taking a stand in a way that is absolutely ingenious. It's so smart and innovative. And they have found a way to come against the spirit of the age in a way that allows their nations not to get influenced in a way that otherwise would be very toxic. So I think that there's a way if we have eyes to see to actually come alongside them and walk more in who God made us to be okay. as the church together. Yeah. So like seeing not this region that traditionally like you look to see like, oh, we need to help brother. How can how can we work together in partnership? How can we gain from each other? Yes. Is really the key for the whole body yes. of Christ totally. and what they're carrying. That's so that's so interesting. And and I would say this, like let me give an example. This 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 is a hard one, but I'll, I'll give it to, to prove my point. We have a, a, a church in our city um, in a, a predominantly black African church. And the leader is a phenomenal woman. She's an apostolic leader. She has planted churches all over the world, not just in Africa, other nations as well. And um, I remember we had a group of Western missionaries that came a while ago. And they're like um, working with us with maybe middle upper class um, university students and when they heard they're going to go to this specific church they're like oh we can't wait now we can go do ministry and I'm like you're about to get blessed because this woman is probably one of the most anointed people I've ever met in my life you don't have to go to get ministry you got, you're about to get ministered too mm -hmm. <laughs> and, and I think that is a little bit of like the change in paradigm is asking yourself the question wow have I made myself the hero right. that needs to go save other people Yeah. or is Jesus the only hero and I'm being led by him to my brothers and sisters. And if they're led in a mud hut, live in a mud hut or a palace in a high tech Silicon Valley or in some small village in the middle of the Sahara Desert, we are still, none of us are the experts. We're all disciples of Jesus. Mm -hmm. And when we take that position of humility, I believe God actually empowers the body to be the body. And then there's only one head and we don't become superhero Christians in that way. Right. So what would you say to like a young person who is burning for the Lord and they're like, man, I, my, I have a heart for Africa. I don't know what that looks like. I don't yes. They're like 18 years old. They live in Toronto and they're just yes. like, man, I'm burning to see this happen. What would you say to them to like put, point them towards a, yes. a, a healthy mindset, but also like practically to, yeah. to walk that out? And, and, and I would say that simple answer, and it's not cop out, I'll expand a bit, is ask God what you should do and wait till he answers you. Right? And if you wait longer than two days, Google why I'm Kona and join them. Okay, and then go on to Africa. <laughs> That's a great answer. Right? So, and, and the reason I'm saying that is like, God wants to see Africa touched, Yeah. right? But I, I, I so believe that God speaks to us and how to do what he asks us. You're right. Yeah. With my whole life, you could put a gun to my head and go like, I believe God speaks, you can pull the trigger, right? But outside of that, I would say the following. I would say that to prepare your heart you need to be careful not to step into the line as, as the West, I need to, oh, shame, which is Afrikaans saying of, I need to step back because I don't have a voice. 
that's like the spur of the age, like this yucky, you need to be careful because you're from the West. That, that's not what we're saying. We're saying you need to show up as the West and run, run alongside me. That's a different conversation, right? Because right. the spur of the age is if you show up as, as the West, you need to step back and let me lead you. When I, I, I think like, no, no, no. When we all show up on the field, all of us step down and Jesus leads us. None of us steps back. We go down. And as we go low and we go slow, Jesus leads us and where he's going. Mm -hmm. And we never have the idea that I am coming with the answer. Right. I'm more coming like, hey, Jesus is the answer. And whenever he is not, no, I'll, I'll, pres I'll, I'll bring him to the forefront. But at the end of the day, the best thing a young kid from Toronto can do is to be a young kid from Toronto. You, you, you yeah. cannot pretend you're yeah. not that, yeah. right? But the way that you, that you run alongside what God is doing, you should go low and you say like, hey, um, I might not know a lot about African culture, but what I do know a lot about is I know how to crush Instagram. I can serve you an in Instagram. Like that's just a stupid example, but bring what you have to the table. Yeah. And for that kid, the best way to do it is just to go low and go like, how do I see God touch people? And I would just say, burn, love God. It's not so complicated. I think people overcomplicate things so yeah, many times. Keep it simple. Keep it simple. <laughs> Burn for the Lord, hear God's voice. Yes, and just do it. Do it. <laughs> Go. Listen, <laughs> obey, and never give up. Yeah. It's like the why motto. <laughs> it's simple, right? And if the whole, it's so simple, children can do it. Mm -hmm. And it's so difficult, even the smartest people in the world leave to do it. Mm -hmm. Wow, that's profound. I, I'd love to like, so I know that most of sub-Saharan Africa mm -hmm. is Christian, and then the most of ab above that yeah. is predominantly Muslim. Yes. Correct. Yeah, yeah. So what what are you believing for in like okay, we're there's a ton of young people that are burning, they're doing all of these things. Like, what does that look like in the world? Like, what what's the fruit of that? You know, like where are they where do you see Africans like going and being sent? You talked about like the West and and mm -hmm. in Europe and also in like America, um, but what does it look like for the unreached? Yeah, yeah, that's a great, that's a great question. We have friends we met, we just did this thing um, with one of our friends, Ned Edwards, um, from uh, the stirring on called Preachers. And it's like this preaching thing we did and we, we were like, what, I think 65, 64 people and 11 of them were from um, different areas in Africa. And then I think that the other third of us were from South Africa and then people were from other nations in the world. But those 11, uh, I think half of them were, no, there was two guys from Ethiopia, sorry. And these Ethiopian guys, they're my age, I'm 32, and maybe a little bit younger. They have over the last five years planted 26 churches and all of them in the Horn of Africa. Oh, wow. And they want to plant over the next five years, a hundred more, I think. Dang, that's like that. There's Bro, not like, that many churches in like no, the Horn of Africa yeah. is the most persecuted area in the world. Yeah, that's incredible. So they're just Ethiopian huh. church planters. Yeah. Planting churches all over the hardest place to plant churches in the world. Mm. Right? Yeah. And we asked them about it, and they're like, well, it's simple. We read the Bible and do what it tells us. It says make <laughs> disciples and we'd go do it. Right? And 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 you you talk to them and and their ingenuity is phenomenal. I was like, this is genius. Can I just copy all their ideas? Right, and I and I think that's one example specifically of young people doing it. Like, there's just such a, a a great movement of young people in Africa, like pushing the hardest and the darkest. Right, we 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 have other friends that are right now translating Bibles, right into languages that's never had it. Like our friends in Nigeria, I think they're like translating New Testament. Like I think it's like 36 different languages in the next 12 months. Wow, and some of those right don't even have like written languages no right it's that's oral. crazy it's little oral it's like there, i think there's 200 million people in africa who don't have a written language wow right so yeah. they're they're working and these are africans being translators of the languages that nobody has even thought is valuable enough mm -hmm. right why do people translate a lot of times not the bible but anything else they translate because of economic means if i can speak to you i can make money with you right Right? That makes sense. Commerce. R commerce. Mm -hmm. Right? It's the easiest way to get tons of stuff translated. Mm -hmm. Right? I can make money if I can understand you. Right? But the gospel says, I don't need to make money from you. You have value because you're God's child. Mm -hmm. Right? So these people are going to languages not even written. You know, like, like there might be 500 of you. Right? The, some of the, the 
translation organizations doesn't even, they call them dialects, which means like they're kind of a language. But if you speak a dialect, you don't think it's a dialect. Yeah, it's just your it's language. It's your language. <laughs> And so I think even when we think about some of these friends of ours as going into war zones and going to some of these crazy places to translate, like some of these guys translate Christians translating to Muslims that in other generations will have persecuted them, right? But that's the heart of like our African brothers and sisters is what they're doing is they're actually sacrificing themselves so that people who there's no economic benefit, nothing for them outside of, I believe Jesus values your tribe. Mm, he values your love. people. The selfless love. Yeah, that is the that is the example that Christ set for us, and that's what we're seeing our brothers and sisters are doing. Yeah, it it seems so <clears throat> simple to, and we can at least I do this all the time, and I see so many young people. We make it so complicated. We try where God where God's sending us, where our callings, our giftings, like all these things, and it just seems like it's it's just simple. <laughs> Amen. Yeah. And I think I think a part of that is. A way a lot of us get told to think about how do we find out what we're made for is you do a, a test and it tells you what you're good at. But I think about Jesus talking, calling the 12. He says, hey, come and follow me and I'll make you fishers of men. That's not very descriptive, right? But I believe the key of the molding was the following. So Peter became Peter because he followed, mm. right? John became John because he followed. And it's it's in being with Christ that we get made into his image and we discover like what he has placed in us. It, it talks in the scriptures, it says that work out your salvation. You work it out because Christ worked something into you. And so I believe that with young people listening to this, anybody who wants to do ministry on missions or just a life of radical obedience to Jesus, the specifics sometimes snares us up because we have a fear of failure and Dallas Road talks about in his book on hearing God he says sometimes we want to hear God's voice because we want to guarantee that we cannot fail wow yeah right and yeah. that's not the idea yeah hearing his voice is being close to his person mm -hmm. that's almost like a yeah you're driven by fear at that yes point. Mm -hmm. you're driven by something that's actually self-centered mm -hmm. and has nothing to do with the beauty of intimacy and so when you're talking about, man, sometimes we're overcomplicating. I do it all the time. That's why I said earlier is that this phrase, listen, obey, never give up. It is so simple. I can teach literally a three-year-old how to do it. But it's so hard that the smartest, most gifted people in the world don't want to keep doing it. Because we think we outgrow the need to be led. And I think that I've just seen in my own life personally, like, the more I can learn how to yield to his leadership, the complexity might increase as I do harder things, but it also simplifies because I recognize that it, my identity is not based on my output. It's based on who he's made me to be. And a lot of times, negative complexity, not the positive complexity that challenges us and releases dopamine and is the good complexity, the negative complexity that paralyzes us actually is all to do with if I would put it that way, where my wiring is put together in trying to prove things to other people or respond to fear or be driven from something that's not God's design. Mm. Like when I'm out of alignment with the things of the Lord, that's when things get confusing. Exactly. And get, you know, overthink things and yes. feel anxious. And, 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 and not aligned doesn't mean you know the details. It just means that like for me to get to point B is not because I actually want to get there with God is because I want to not fail or I don't want to look like I'm wasting my life or I don't want to not have finances. When these negative things become your primary drive, confusion usually comes in because now we're mixing those things with what God is saying. And God is like, hey, I'm saying, don't be anxious with anything. But in all prayers and petition come to me. God says, do not fear, right? And so we're mixing these things and, and, and that's what makes it complex. So I just have, I've learned that if I live the type of life that says, God, I just want to follow you. What usually happens is complexity melts and I can simply do what he asks me to do next. And he's kind of like zealous in that way where he does that and he goes like, hey, just follow me, I got you. And then he does things that none of us could have planned. Mm 
Mm. And that's what I've seen in South Africa. One step at a time. Yes. Yeah. That's beautiful. (laughs) It's so much fun, honestly. I I, I tell this to all of our staff consistently. This really is the best job we've ever had. This is a bit, I cannot believe I get to do this because consistently in the midst of the trials, in the midst of losing friends, in the midst of some of the wildness that we experience, I see on a daily basis, people radically get changed by Jesus. And there's nothing that's a better, to some extent, paycheck in my heart than going like, man, I I remember you. And now you're something else because God touched you. That is worth everything that we do. Yeah, the transformation. The transformation. That's how you change the world. Exactly. One wow. person at a time. Whoa. Well, that's a pretty good pitch to uh, to come join you and run in South Africa from Fire exactly. Fragrance. Yes. So if anybody <laughs> out there listening is... Uh, just looking to to run with Gabe. Check out Fire and Fragrance in yes. South Africa. <laughs> Please come. You guys are welcome. We need way more people. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. Well, I think that's uh, everything. I'll let you catch a flight <laughs> Thanks, back bro. to South Africa. The, a Appreciate long journey. Um, but yeah, I thank you so much for uh, for sharing. Thanks, Liam. Bless you, buddy. <laughs> of course.